Thank you. Hello. How many of you are wearing these, one of these? How many of you keep checking the time on it? I keep feeling it and going, oh, what is, oh, it's Mickey time. It's stupid. Anyway, my name is Jeffrey. I'm a web designer. Hello, everybody. And as a web designer, I work on projects. And what happens usually at the start of a project is that I meet with stakeholders. Any of you do that? Meet with the people in charge of the project before working on something to find out what their business goals are, what they want to achieve, that sort of thing. And typically, in almost every meeting I've ever been in, in all the years I've been doing this, the number one, well, first, it was eyeballs. Everybody wanted eyeballs. Does any, is anyone else senior enough in the business to remember eyeballs? Okay. Okay, and then after that it was engagement. We want more engagement. The people are coming, but they're not clicking. They're clicking, but they're not clicking through. They're linking, but they're not deep linking. They're only spending five seconds. They should be spending seven seconds, right? Anyone had those kinds of conversations? Any, is everyone awake? Okay. Hello, it's Orlando. I know you were at Disney till like midnight last night. I totally get it, but we're here to work, people. Okay. Engagement is the number one request that I get every time I start a project, but I don't think it necessarily should be, and that's the, where I want to start. Now, there are websites where engagement absolutely is critical. Who recognizes this? Instagram, thank you. Instagram is a, 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 an addictive substance uh, that you take in through your eyes, and whole years of your life can be spent there without you realizing that time has passed. Uh, basically, if you're stuck in an airport or you're waiting for a meeting and everyone else is late or you're at your kid's birthday party, shame on you. You're checking Instagram. I know you are. I've done it too. Uh, we can be honest here. And uh, that's a site where engagement is critical. That's their whole thing, engagement. So if you work on Instagram or a site like that, engagement is the right thing for you and you could ignore the first part of this. So go get yourself an extra coffee or an extra muffin. Okay, also, if you work on a deep content site, engagement is what you want, right? So if you send the great, world's greatest travel uh, uh, writer and the world's greatest travel photographer as a team on a tour of islands with a $25,000 budget and say, come back in two months, well, let's be real, with inflation, come back in a week with a, a story about the islands and how people can spend money in the islands. Uh, and you want people to actually spend time reading that article and looking at the photos and going through the carousel. It's actually a place where a carousel would not be, where a carousel might be actually welcome, right? It's like the one place where a carousel might be welcome. People go, well, I want to look at all these great pictures. I'll, I'll just page through them, okay? So a place like that, you want engagement. Or maybe you work on something like this. This is called Fun Brain. It's for kids, you know, for kids. And it, it's basically reading is hard. Many kids have trouble with it. That's because our brains weren't designed for it. We've only been, we've been around as a species for a million years and we've been reading for maybe a couple thousand years and most humans haven't been reading except for the last couple of hundred years. Right? And so it's hard. It's, our brains aren't wired for it. We have to rewire them. And we have to do that when we're very young, when we're already learning stuff like what gravity is and why you shouldn't eat dirt. Right? You're already a kid learning a million things. When daddy makes that face, it's not good. Right? You're learning all these things. And now on top of that, you have to learn reading. It's hard. So there's all kinds of ways of helping kids learn to read. And, and one of the ways is but through game technology. And so Fun Brain is a place that makes it fun to read and kids bookmark things and they come back and they, they highlight their favorite passages and there you want engagement. If you're creating content for a specific audience and you want them to highlight pages and share them with their friends and come back and contribute, you want engagement. Or maybe you have a magazine, right? A content website. So this is a list apart. This is my content website. We've been publishing since 1998. I don't know if there's any a list of part readers in the audience, but uh, oh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, it is a site for people who make websites, so it's uh, the same stuff we t we're going to talk about over the next three days, right? Uh, front end and design, user experience, 
user interface design, uh, usability, accessibility, what should we do, what can we make, should we make that, all those questions. And a list of part articles, there's, there's several kinds of web articles, right? There's, uh, there's here's, how to, here's some code to do something. Right, there's that kind of web publication where you just basically search Google, go, I forget, how do I make an accordion flyout menu? And then you, you Google accordion flyout menu code, and then you come to a site, uh, usually one of two or three sites, and go, okay, there it is, grab the code and go. That's not what we do. Or there's um, listicles, right? 15 great free fonts, 15 amazing retro looks. 15 great new Photoshop tricks, whatever. Those are called listicles, you all know that. Um, those, that's fine, that's not what we write. We write articles that uh, people actually put months of their lives into and they do research and we have technical editors look at it and say, I like that, but there's some prior art you're not acknowledging and it's a kind of an arduous process to get a list of part article uh, sold through and finalized for the public, and so we hope that people will actually spend time. So if you have a site like that, you actually want engagement. You actually want people to spend more than a few seconds. And the most gratifying thing we ever get at a list of part is like, wow, people are spending three minutes. That's amazing, because you've got to factor in all the people who Googled it and go, oh, that's not what I want, and left. Right, so like, like maybe a third, two thirds of the readers are actually spending no time, and still, we're averaging uh, three minutes or two and a half minutes, that's great. That means there's people spending 10 minutes on our site, which is all a website could hope to ask for, right? Unless it's like the mystery of life or I don't, I don't know what, like online, I don't know. 10 minutes to me would be amazing, right? But 10 minutes is what people are asking for, but they're asking for it on sites where it actually doesn't make sense to ask for it. So. Here's the kind of site most folks in this room probably work on. And this is the kind of site when I get involved in a project, I'm usually brought in on something like this, right? I'm not brought in on the Washington Post. I'm brought in on something like Blue Cross Blue Shield. I didn't work on this. I'm just saying it's the kind of project I do. Probably the kind of project most people in the room do. There's a service or variety of services, a product, you're in some kind of customer support or you're providing information about your business or you're letting people change their cable uh, or change their phone or something like that. You're interacting with the public and providing a service like Blue Cross Blue Shield does. And when people come to Blue Cross Blue Shield, they're not saying, I'd like to really engage with this website. I woke up this morning wondering if Blue Cross Blue Shield had published any of those wonderful white papers where they talk about the future of corporate insurance. Nobody, nobody wakes up and thinks that. People go to the Blue Cross Blue Shield site because they want to know, will dad's operation be covered? That's it. My dad's sick, is his operation covered? Do we need supplemental insurance? Are we going to be out of pocket? What's going to happen? Can his own doctor see him or does a different doctor have to see him? People are coming to sites to ask questions like that. And believe it or not, when your dad's sick, you actually don't want to spend 10 minutes engaging. You just want an answer to your question and you want to go. It's like if you bought a toaster and the toaster didn't work and you bring it back to Macy's and you go to the booth and you say, hi, my toaster doesn't work. You want the Macy's person to either say, I'll give you a replacement toaster or I'll give you your money back and that's it. You don't want them to say, I'll give you a refund, but first, let me tell you about a young boy from the Midwest who always dreamed of working at Macy's. That boy is me. Now let me tell you my story. I woke this morning, well, first of all, I have an alarm. It's a fun alarm. Let me tell you about my alarm. You, know, you don't want that. You don't want to engage. It's not that you don't care about that other human, it's that that's not what you're there for. It's not a social get together. And that's how most people use most of the stuff we put out on the web and most of the apps we make. They come to do a job and get on with their life. Unless we are making Instagram or, or something equally compulsory like that, most people are coming to do a job and move on with their life and we're not letting them do that. When we're asking for engagement, when we're saying, 
customer didn't spend enough time, our average customer isn't spending enough time. Well, if a customer spends 30 minutes on our website, does that mean they were engaged? Or does that mean they're frustrated? Probably frustrated depends on the site, depends on what else your analytics tell you, but probably frustrated. So instead of worrying about engagement, I'm here to talk about maybe coming up with a different metric, something we can guide our stakeholders toward, something we can talk to our teams about as we iterate on the next phase of our product or project, as we sit down, right, with our managers, our, our company executives, our designers, developers, our, just our team, the marketing people, everyone on the team, everyone you interface with. As we sit down with them, or stand up if you do stand ups, I'm a dad, I'm allowed to make one joke like that per talk. Um, as we get together with those people, uh, maybe what we should be looking for is how quickly can we let people do what they came to do and get out of their way, and how quickly can we get them the essential information they need to know about us. So I'm looking at a new metric, I'm call it's about speed of usefulness, and I call it the content performance quotient. And the reason I call it that is because business people like acronyms and they like stuff that sounds businessy. And that's the only reason. Otherwise, I would have a much simpler name for this. I'm calling it the content performance quotient so you can tell your managers and folks who brought their managers with them to the thing, no disrespect, but this is just how business works. Business people want to utilize, designers want to use. That's just how it is. It's just a different world. And so content performance quotient is language that is designed to help you get buy-in. And I call it the design CPQ, and the reason I do that is because there's a million things out there called CPQ. So if you were to Google CPQ after this talk, I don't know what you'd come up with. Nothing scary, because I checked. I don't believe there's anything freaky out there for CPQ. Nevertheless, design CPQ is a better bet, because that's how you'll get to this thing. In fact, I've started a little Twitter feed called Design CPQ. It's at Design CPQ. Um, I don't, it's not totally overflowing with content. I post when things are important that are related to this topic. But this is a topic about whittling down getting permission and buy-in from the people we work for and with to whittle down instead of building up. Okay, and what is the design CPQ? There's several different ways of looking at it. It's a measurement of how quickly we get the right content to the customer. Getting the right content to the right person at the right time is the definition of UX, or one definition of UX, right? Good UX gets the content the person was looking for to them with the minimum expenditure of effort on their part. Put another way, how quickly can you solve the customer's problem? Is my, dad's, is my dad's operation covered? The quicker I get an answer to that, the better you design CPQ, the better job you're doing as designers, developers, UX folks, strategists, marketers, all the people who work together to create digital content. If you have a kid and you've ever helped with math, or if you ever were a kid, I think that takes in most of us, um, it's a measurement of, it's the shortest distance between the problem and solution. It's a measurement of your value to the customer. I'm gonna keep going with these definitions. I hate when people read bullet points, but I'm gonna read some bullet points because there may be people in the back who can't read the bullet points, or there may be folks who just uh, can't see very well or whatever, so I'm gonna read these bullet points. Um, it's a measurement that gives you a new goal to iterate against, right? As you're replacing engagement, that's not what we're looking for. So we're looking for, we've shaved it down by three seconds. People get to their answers faster. They're spending less time on our site, hooray. I mean, it's human nature. We spend all our time. We come in at eight in the morning, we leave at six or later, spending all our time working on this website. We're proud of it. We're proud of all the little improvements we constantly make to it. So of course, in our minds, it would be great if the whole public were to come and spend hours on our website, enjoying the rounded corners and the beautiful other details that we've created for their pleasure. But that's not really what happens, right? So we have a new goal to iterate against, get them out fast, like your McDonald's, 
Let's get these people fed like you're the, like you're the army. We got, a, we got 100 hungry soldiers, let's get them all fed and back out in the field, right? Get them all fed, get them back out in the field. That's what our website's for. Let's funnel them through. Let's help them get what they want. It's a new way to deliver value, right? You can actually measure and talk about the value you're providing to your customer. Instead of say, bragging about how many pages they click through, you can brag about how few pages they had to click through, which gives you a new way to evaluate the success of the website. Hey boss, people are spending almost no time at all on our site, isn't that great? Sounds crazy, sounds counterintuitive, that's why I'm going on at some length about it and why I'm gonna be giving you kinds of ammunition and different ways to think about it and talk about it so that you can sell it through. Because believe it or not, one of the joys of your job is about to be removing the stuff that no one cares about, getting rid of it. Half, the, half our problem as information architects is that we have too much content to begin with. So we come up with these incredibly complex taxonomies and these incredibly complex schemes to get people to basically ignore all the stuff that's irrelevant to them anyway and get to the one thing that's relevant. Well, we're gonna make our jobs as information architects easier because we're gonna make the customer's job easier because we're going to think about their mental model, their mental journey, their needs, and we're gonna focus everything on their needs and the few things the company absolutely needs to tell anyone who comes to the site, and we're gonna remove everything else. CPQ, from the customer's point of view, it's the time it takes to get the information they came for. And from the organization's point of view, it's the time it takes to, in addition to doing that for the customer, get out the important information about your company that they really need to know. We're the insurance company for families. We're the, we're the folks who help you get your first house. Whatever it is that your business or organization does, we're defeating cancer. Whatever it is that your organization does, you probably have an important set of words or several important sets of words and perhaps words and images that convey that very quickly. You want to get to that. You want to present that. You want to make sure everyone who comes to the website is oriented. They know what the website's about. They understand why they're there. They understand within a second why they're there and what you do. Probably you're just confirming what they thought you do anyway because they're there for a reason. People aren't randomly typing in letters and, and, and typing .com after it and seeing what they get. They're coming for a reason, but you need to confirm and verify that they came to the right place. If you come to an Event of Parts website, we better have some words saying that we're a conference for people who make digital content. We're a conference for UX and front end folks. We better have that content up there because there are gonna be people who don't know what we do. You might tell your boss, I'd like to go to this event, and if our website doesn't immediately convey the information of that we're exactly for someone in your job, that we have information exactly for your job, then guess what? The boss has no reason to send you there, right? So every website, every business has to convey certain fundamental information about itself as quickly as possible, along with doing its primary job, which is to help the customer, the user, the person who needs something from us, okay? And everything else that we put on the website, no matter how well done it is, is garbage. We could have the best writers in the world, we could have the best layout artist, we could get the best illustrators and copy editors and proofreaders, we could hire teams of brilliant photographers, we could spend years making absolutely great content, but if it doesn't solve the customer's problem and it doesn't tell about the organization, it's pretty garbage. And if we're mostly spending our time on questions of formatting and questions of delivery, if we're making it faster, but it's still garbage. If we're making it more responsive, but it's still garbage. If we're making it seem more performant, whether it is or it isn't. If we're making it seem like it loads faster, which is very important, right? If we're doing that, but it's still not what the customer wants, then it's garbage. Um, a frequent Avana Part speaker, um, uh, Jerry McGovern, uh, often talks about an experience he had where he was doing some consulting for a search engine and no one was actually responsible for the accuracy of the content, the accuracy of the search query results. So there were engineers who were making things faster, there were, engineer, there were all kinds of people who made it, you know, who did keywords and everything else, but no one was responsible for the correctness. 
And so basically what you had was a search engine giving faster and faster bad results. So basically, they were not solving the customer's problem. They failed on design CPQ. Great performance, right? Great optimization. They removed all the friction. You could type two letters and it would know what you were looking for. It was brilliant. They used artificial intelligence. They had everything, except they gave you the wrong answer. So it was useless. It was garbage. And if we're mainly spending, if we're spending our time on all the other things we have to spend our time on, responsiveness and uh, brand appropriateness and good layout and navigability and readability and all those wonderful things, but we're not thinking about is the content the right content that tells about our company and gives the customer the information she came for, then we're making pretty garbage. And garbage in a, responsive, a delightfully responsive grid is still garbage. So how do we do this? How do we start thinking differently about this? How do we approach what we do and come up with uh, ways to get shorter, because short is good, short is good, and uh, we want to make our sites shorter and leaner and faster and more accurate to the customer's need. How do we do that? Well, one way we can look at history and look at examples of people who have had similar problems with different technologies. So years and years ago, uh, there's an ad agency called Leo Burnett in Chicago, a very famous agency, and they got the Marlboro account right, a tobacco account. Now, if you hate smoking, if you know somebody that got sick from smoking, please leave that aside, I understand, but we're not here to judge smoking or smokers or tobacco companies, we're just here to go, good job ad agency. Can you do that? I know that sounds really evil, right? Like, good job, machine gun, killed more people faster. I know, it sounds really bad what I'm saying, but just put aside any negative thoughts about cigarettes just for the purpose of this little walkthrough. Okay, so Marlboro were filtered cigarettes in a, in a, in a bustling post-war economy after World War II where men were back from the war, they were at their jobs, women were now working because that had started happening much more frequently during World War II. There was all kinds of gender uh, role change being discussed for the first time since like the 1920s. Lots of stuff was going on culturally and one thing they knew, men smoked unfiltered cigarettes. Everybody smoked. Doctors smoked, preachers smoked, children smoked, dogs smoked, monkeys smoked. Everybody smoked back then. Just watch, watch I Love Lucy, right? Watch any old TV show, the characters smoke all the way through. But men smoked unfiltered cigarettes. That was the manly thing. Get the cancer faster. You're a man, damn it. And, and women smoked filtered cigarettes because that was dainty or whatever, I don't know. And so Leo Burnett, like most ad agencies, got this thankless job. Take this thing that men hate and make them love it. Make men want to smoke our filtered cigarette. And so they could have done what every other ad agency was doing at the time. If you look at like uh, reels of old commercials, you can find them on Amazon streaming or they're in museums of like mo the Museum of the Mo Moving Image or you can get them in a discount bin for like 99 cents at, you know, in a, in a video bin at a big store, right? It'll be like uh, DVDs of commercials from the 1950s. Watch them. It's fascinating. First of all, commercials were 60 seconds long. Can you imagine sitting through a commercial for 60 seconds? They were black and white most of the time, and they had wall-to-wall -wall announcer copy. Like what I'm doing now, a person talking at you, which I'm gonna be doing for 60 minutes, I'm feeling really uncomfortable now. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I'm kidding, thank you. Thank you to both people who laughed. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so, they had a person talking at you and they were talking about cigarette benefits. They'd be, it didn't matter, it was a floor wax. They'd be telling you why this was the greatest floor wax. If there was cigarettes, they talked about doctors saying, it's the T-zone in your lungs that gives the good clean smoke that gets in your lungs and feels so darn good. And, like, and then they would have, you know, I love this cigarette. Like people talked all the way through. They talked all the way through and it was black and white and there were demos in the middle and it was just a disaster. And so these people went completely sideways. They photographed cowboys in color with like Vaseline on the lens. These were people who would go on to make movies like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. But in their youth, they were making commercials and they just photographed these men riding horses because they could think of nothing more manly and rugged 
right, than just guys riding around in chaps all day. It has a different connotation now, trust me. It was just totally rugged back then. And so guys riding around on horses, sweating together, guys looking meaningful at each other. Again, different time. But uh, these guys, they didn't even show them using the product. At the very end, they might show a guy puffing once on a cigarette, and it just said, come to where the flavor is, come to Marlboro Country. Ten words. The first, six, the first 49 seconds, or whatever, the first almost 60, full 60 seconds was just guitar music and guys on horses. And then at the very end, they snuck in the message with 10 words instead of the 60 to 120 words that were more typical of the time. And then they did something even more brilliant. They shortened it to come to Marlboro country. Within a few years, it was just come to Marlboro country. And by the end of our journey in the mid 60s, if you were a little kid riding in a car with your parents and you passed a billboard, it probably just looked like this, Marlboro and a cowboy. And it worked, and I know it worked, and here's how I know it worked. When I was in eighth grade, I smoked Marlboro. And so did every other boy in my class. Again, a different time. And I mean the jocks smoked, the freaks smoked, the nerds smoked, the kid that sniffed glue in the back room in, in metal shop smoked, and the little kid that wanted to be left alone and just draw pictures smoked. I won't say which of those I was, probably many of them, but uh, not a jock, I, basically the rest probably. Uh, the hood smoked, everybody smoked. Marlboro, all the boys smoked Marlboro. Even the you know, nice boys that were sweet and mean boys, everybody smoked because you had to to be a man because it worked. Again, purely evil, but what we're focusing on is not the brainwashing and degeneration of an entire generation of children, but rather the brilliance with which art directors and copywriters came at this and approached it a different way and mercilessly slashed, and you know why? they were allowed to cut all the copy because they delivered results. And that's why we're allowed. We can cut our websites into little pieces if we deliver results, if they're actually working better for our bosses, our managers, if we're actually working better for our customers, then we have permission. That's how you get permission, results. That's what business cares about, results. Well, brand impression and results. Mainly results, bottom line. And the more you do for your customer, the better for your bottom line. So again, the more usable you are, the more customer focused, the more you take inclusive design into account, the more you think about the customer, relentlessly focusing on what the customer needs, the more likely that you'll sell tickets or sell products or get subscriptions or get donors, whatever it is that your organization's trying to do. So how do you do this? How do you shrink your content? One of the simplest ways is to just keep asking, why do we need this? As you come upon a piece of content on your homepage, on a, on a landing page, ask, why do we need this, and compare it to your goals. If it orients the user to that section of the site, or it tells something important about your company that isn't available uh, elsewhere on the page, or it answers a customer's question, then it's good. Otherwise, it goes in the bin or you at least have permission to ask permission to throw it in the bin. Now, when I say compare it to your goals, this assumes that you have some. Some of us work at places where we're just given assignments and we're not part of the strategic team and we don't know why we're asked to be, do certain things. And that's a problem with siloing in a workplace in America right now where sometimes People don't know why they're being asked to do what they do. It's really helpful if everyone's on the same page. Just like good branding is everyone's job, usability is everyone's job, accessibility is everyone's job. We're gonna be talking about this for the next three days. In the same way, goal setting and understanding business goals and the customer's goals should be everybody's job. Whether you write the code or you're designing the, the interface module by module, or you're doing page layout, whatever it is that you're doing, or you're the manager. It should always be about the customer and the business. Every design is intentional. If it isn't, it's not really design, it's decoration. If it isn't done to achieve a goal, it's not design. If your design isn't aiming 
somewhere. And if every element of your design isn't contributing toward a goal, moving toward a goal, then it's, uh, it's not helpful and may need to be eliminated. And I'm not saying every rounded corner or drop shadow needs to have a specific business rationale. That's silly. But what I am saying is every major component of a design should be doing something, helping the reader understand what they're looking at, guiding someone through an interface, answering a user's question, advancing knowledge about the company. One of some, the greatest things that happened for our business is this. Because these little things came, even if we don't work on apps, if we work on websites, these little things came along. And suddenly we were like, how am I going to cram this 100 pounds of spaghetti onto this tiny screen? And the answer became, no, we're not going to. We can't take these home pages where we give every stakeholder everything they want, and there's carousels, and there's hero images, and there's a million flyout menus, and there's a thousand things on the page because everyone's got a 27-inch screen, we assume. Not true, but we assume because the CEO has a 27-inch screen, so therefore we put everything up there. Now we have to assume, then we, now we have to assume people are going to be looking on a tiny screen. And in fact, 60% right now of web use happens on this little screen, which means even at work, and I know I do this, I sit in front of a big monitor at work and I pull out my phone to get certain things done because it's actually easier with my phone, right? Lots of stuff is happening on the phone and the phone is a great leveler. It says, see all this content that you've been dumping here? You don't have that luxury anymore. It's like imagine if you lived in a place where real estate was cheap and you had a big house and over 30 years or 20 years, you amassed all kinds of stuff and you never threw anything away. Old bicycles, your kids in college, but you've still got their Barbie dolls on the floor, like everything's there. Now imagine that you move to Tokyo where real estate is very expensive and you have a tiny apartment. You can't bring all that stuff. It won't fit in the tiny apartment. So you actually have to think, you have to go through the painful exercise of going, what does the family need? Maybe the old Barbie dolls have, should go to a poor child who needs a toy, and we shouldn't try to carry them with us, right? I'm not going to overstrain the metaphor. But the small screen is the Tokyo apartment, but also the customer's attention is the Tokyo apartment. The small screen is a metaphor for the customer's attention. The customer doesn't have time to waste. If they ever did, they don't now. 15 years ago when the web was more of a novelty, people were like, I'm gonna go spend the day like looking at Kotki and Daring Fireball and just browsing my blog roll and my favorite sites. Nobody does that now. I mean, they may look at Huffington Post or whatever, but basically people are using the internet to work or to socialize on a social network those two things. They're not spending tons of time at our websites, and we have to think about that and design accordingly, and we're not. And the small screen helped us get there. And Luke Rablewski, a frequent event apart speaker, um, wrote a book called Mobile First, and it's a great book. Uh, and and I, I, uh, it basically said, take all that stuff, Get rid of everything except the essential thing that the customer needs. That's what's going on that little screen. And now, when you go back to your big screen, do the same thing. Just because you have a 27-inch screen doesn't mean people want to see a giant image of a woman smiling at her salad bowl. <laughs> right? If it's a nutrition site, maybe they just want to find out what they ate that day, how many calories or how much protein. They don't really need all that extra junk. The small screen informs the big screen. Again, small screen is metaphor for, now I sound like Confucius, the small screen is a metaphor for the customer's attention. It's very limited. They're trying to do lots of stuff. They didn't come to spend the day on your website. So how did we get here? All right. Any other uh, old folks in the crowd? Can I get this one? How did we get here? OK. No? David Byrne, Talking Heads, Punk Rock. Thank you. OK. How we got here? One thing we did was we prioritized, oh man, why did I 
phrase this this way, it's so hard to say, we prioritize meetings over meaning. One of the things that we do, and, and we're going to be talking more about meetings later in this conference, but we all have to go to meetings, we generally hate it, and we generally want to get out without anyone yelling or getting fired. Like it's a good meeting if no one yelled or get, got fired, right? And so we wanted to have good meetings, and so instead of making the painful decisions you have to make when you're actually thinking of the customer's limited attention, when you're actually thinking about the small screen, when you're forced to deal with the small screen, we got used to the luxury of the big screen and just said, yeah, sure, we can put everything in. Let's make everyone happy. Every department's the most important department. Everything's above the fold. Everything's in the nav. That's right, and we'll add two more navs. What are you gonna do when you, have, you can only have three navigation items and you might even have to hide them behind a hamburger menu? But, you, but what you're used to is a world where you've got like 57 flyouts and you spend all day going from website to website going, oh, I like this flyout, look at the transparency. It's nice, it's got this nice effect. Like we used to all geek out on stuff like that. Or I would geek out on like, this is a flyout menu, but it's standards compliant. Yes, it's much harder to code, but it's standards compliant, right? We prioritize meetings over meeting, giving everybody what they want making a bad experience for the customer, putting the customer last. That doesn't work, that's how we got here. And to make matters worse, we invented the CMS, shown here in its first, uh, this is actually movable type, uh, I think the first version of movable type, or might have been the first uh, version of WordPress, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, we basically, we abandoned ships, so when I started doing this, the customer, the, my, my client, would send me a Word document and say, please turn this into HTML. And I'm, I would say, I know how to do that and you're gonna pay me. And that was how I earned my living, by like taking their crap and turning it into HTML. But then that became uh, unreasonable as the web scaled up, the internet scaled up. We went from the web is this nifty thing that some hip companies are sort of dabbling into everybody's got to have a website and an app and everything else and everybody's using it all the time and they're always connected and they're walking in traffic, walking into cars, looking at a screen, right? Everybody's hypnotized by this thing. Everybody's addicted to it. It's constant information, right? But in the, in the, in the, as we were moving toward that, we suddenly had a scale problem where you couldn't just give a designer a Word document and ask them, to convert it to HTML at their convenience. So the, so the client had to be able to do it themselves. And they did it with a CMS. We invented the CMS and went, aren't we smart? We've really empowered our customers. It's easy to give everybody what they want. Everybody in the corporation, everyone in the organization. It's easy, but it's the wrong thing. It's harder to do the right thing. You might have a bad meeting. Someone might yell at you. It's harder, but it's essential. It's harder for us to do the right thing, but it's better for the customer, and that's ultimately better for the bottom line. If we're making a website for our convenience, if we're making a website to keep everybody in the room happy, and we're not making the hard choices and having the tough discussions, then we're just passing it along to the, to the customer to figure out our mess. And they'll go somewhere else. If we, make a, if we have an equally good insurance company, but our website is a mess, They'll go to the other insurance company where they can figure out the pricing right away and figure out the ben benefits r right away, and they'll just sign up. It just makes sense. If you had the greatest jewelry store in the world but a bad uh, user experience, people will buy from somewhere else. Doesn't even have to be pretty. Look at Amazon, right? The Amazon, nobody goes to the website and goes, I really love graphic design and I love what Amazon does with type and color. Nobody says that. Nobody with eyes says that. <laughs> but Amazon's great because they're, they're just geniuses at, at anticipating our needs and giving us even more convenience. You don't even have to look for it anymore. It's a button. You know you need toilet paper. Mash the button with your elbow and get toilet paper delivered to your home. You don't want to cross the street to the store. Oh, it's out of business? I don't know how that happened. Anyway, you don't want to cross the street to the store and come home with toilet paper. People will go, what are you doing with that? Oh, that's shameful and embarrassing. Just hit that button with your elbow. Amazon are geniuses, right? They're, they're geniuses of UX. So they actually, 
If you do what's in the customer's interest, and that's your corporate philosophy, you can be very successful. But that's not every corporate philosophy, and so you have to know that if you go this route and try to do these things, you may encounter some resistance. Uh, again, Jerry McGovern, a popular AEA speaker, talks about how people who fight for the customer are like whistleblowers. And they may be heroic, but they're often chastised by the organization, because many organizations aren't about the customer. But we want to work at organizations that are for the customer, and if the customer is being lost sight of, we want to shift our organization toward caring more about the customer. Otherwise, we come up with the web page is the time for God. We have to stop making websites for in 2018 as if we're designing for 2001. It doesn't make sense. You know, just a quick example. You have video content and you put it on your site and nowhere else. That's a mistake. Because where do people actually go for video content? Right? Well, they go to YouTube. Right? Or if they're hipsters, they go to Vimeo. I don't know why. I go to Vimeo. I'm not a hipster. I go to Vimeo and YouTube. My kid just goes to YouTube. They don't go to Google and type video and then look for stuff. They go right to YouTube. So if your content's not on YouTube, guess what? Most of your customers won't find it. So you need to create a, a YouTube channel, even though that's not your job, and even though that's not your website. Yes, you can have it on your website too, and you should make it easy to find on your website. But you should assume that they're going to look for it somewhere else and have it in that other place. And you don't actually need to have it on your website for it to be effective for you. You don't have to build so deep. I want to share a couple of quick stories, mainly for what we can learn from them. This is an article by Eric Kennedy called The King versus Pawn Game of UI Design in A List Apart. King versus Pawn, A List Apart at Google. If you're interested, it's a great game. And they talk about how people usually learn chess. So, so here's the chess board as my dad taught me. My dad taught me I was eight years old, and he figured it was time, because I was a boy and he was an engineer, it was time for me to learn chess. And he showed me all the pieces on the board and everything they did. And about the middle of the, of the lecture, I started playing with the black horse and the white horse going, the black horse and the white horse are racing because I was bored, because I couldn't take it all in. Because what was I doing? I was being on, on a deluge of onboarding. And instead, in this article, they recommend onboarding that's super simple. Give the person what they absolutely need and nothing else. And then, when they have to make another decision, give them what they need. Right? This, this chess master teaches chess by showing someone two kings and a pawn. And says the goal of chess is to capture the other person's or king, or rather, put the other person's king in a position where they can't move, where they're mated, where you'll take them if they move anywhere. And since they're not allowed to move into check, it's checkmate, and the game is won. They teach them that, and then gradually they work their way around to, these are knights, and here's what they do. This is the bishop. This is the queen. But the most important thing is to understand about checkmate. Start there. The, book, the article makes the point, if you strip everything down to its core, then everything you learn is a universal, is a universal principle. And that's a fancy way of saying, just-in-time information is better than bombarding people with tons of stuff. Right, so one of the things we should think about as we sculpt, as we take a scalpel like plastic surgeons to our websites and start removing all the ugly parts that aren't necessary, we should think about stripping it down to the universal principles, stripping it down to what the customer actually needs. Now, many of you may be familiar with atomic design or pattern libraries or uh, that kind, that approach to design where you think about the module doesn't mean there are no pages. Sometimes people say, we don't make pages anymore. Of course we still make pages. But we can start with the component. Um, I, I mentioned jewelry a moment ago. Recently had to do a redesign of a jewelry site. And instead of thinking, what's the beautiful thing I can do with the page layout, I thought, what's the customer trying to do in the shopping cart? What's stopping them from completing the purchase? Actually, most people don't buy jewelry over the web. They look at it. They might want to bookmark it. They might want to set it aside. But they're probably going to come into the store and try it on because it's a lot of money. So what can we do in terms of long tail conversion to make it easier for customers to feel sort of make a commitment to set something aside? And I thought about those kind of interactions first. And I didn't show the, the, I didn't show the client uh, 
beautiful comps. I showed him super crude sketches that took me five seconds to draw so that he could say, I hate this, and we could just crumple it up. And it wasn't a surly, I wasn't like, I hate my client, man. He threw away seven hours of work. Now, that's silly. And I also didn't even have to prototype. I just, I proto literally prototyped by drawing crude stuff, like super storyboards almost, which we'll hear more about in this conference. I just drew, and which Disney pioneered, by the way, right? Uh, drawing pictures of what you're eventually going to animate, drawing pictures of what you're eventually going to film. I drew pictures of interactions. So I didn't even have to write an essay, here's what the customer wants to do. We did research, we figured out what, what didn't work, and then we threw sketches across the table and collaborated in that way. Now we are rigorous in removing friction from shopping carts. If we can do it for shopping carts, we can do the same thing for content. One more quick article. If we don't take a scalpel to our content, what's the other extreme? The other extreme is FAQs, right? We just dump everything the customer might want to know onto a big page and hope that they'll find it themselves. And there's a lot of problems with FAQs. Uh, there's an article by Lisa Wright called No More FAQs, also at a list apart. You can just Google No More FAQs, but it tells about all the problems with FAQs, and there's lots of them. Basically, um, they have a repetitive grammatical structure, right? Everything's how do I this, how do I that, how do I the other. You have a bunch of bullet points and all the sentences start how do I, and the person who's trying to scan keeps saying the same set of words. It makes it very hard to actually visually navigate what they're looking at. And, and you're, you're dumping a bunch of content on people. You're making them figure out the, uh, how it's organized. So you're dumping the cognitive load on the customer and the repetitive grammatical structure makes it even tougher to discern any order at all. And this is the lazy thing that we're used to doing. It comes from the old days, in, you know, in the mid-90s when people were first putting information on the internet. It's also problematic because uh, you can't keep content in sync. If you have content on the actual website that says, well, we've just changed our such and such policy, but the FAQ doesn't know about the change, things get out of sync and customers looking in two different places on your site get two different kinds of information and it doesn't work. So FAQs don't work, FAQs suck, have a nice day. The main problem is FAQ is a demonstration of the kind of content we lazily put online that we have to stop putting online. Now Lisa Wright in her article says something very interesting about FAQs and why they don't work. She says, users come to any type of content with a particular purpose in mind, ranging from highly specific to general learning. And there's one very important word in that sentence. And that word is purpose. It's all about the customer's purpose. So if we're going to start over, if we're going to throw out what we've been doing and, and start from scratch, how do we do that? Well, the waterfall method, and some of you still use that, it, uh, the waterfall method is to do a massive content inventory. Look at all the content you've ever published, make little cards with it or make Excel spreadsheets, and then go through card by card, line by line, do we need this? Why? Shall we migrate it or not? That is a big waste of time, and if you can possibly avoid it, do so. That's a very difficult way to do it. Usually involves hiring outside content strategy consultants whose skills would be better, better served elsewhere. Now, if you're an agile shop, which means you don't know what you're going to be doing from one day to the next because your boss is just going to come in and say, do this now. I'm kidding, but basically, not kidding. Basically, you're constantly iterating and you're constantly getting new goal setting. And every few weeks, you, d you turn something else around. If you're constantly iterating, that's great because that's exactly what you can do with the content. You already have permission. Your management has already bought in on the idea that a website is a work in progress. It's never finished. If you work in-house, which is most people here, if you work for a company, if you're a designer, developer, UX person, strategist at your company, the best thing you can possibly do while you're iterating on the other stuff, start iterating on the content too. Bring up the design CPQ, tell people about it, right? Tell people about it and get their buy into the notion and then say now from a design CPQ point of view, we can probably lose these two paragraphs while we're doing this, while we're cleaning up this section. Or we have these three points, but maybe we can consolidate them into one. 
Lastly, if you come from outside or if you've just gotten a big project and they ask for a big redesign, Cameron Mall always said, Re don't just redesign, realign. Every time someone asks you to reskin the website, it's also an opportunity to rethink it strategically, rethink the branding, rethink uh, the customer experience above all. If you're an outside team or if you're a team with a big, that's just gotten this big project, then you have an opportunity to basically throw out all the content and start fresh. This is what I try to do with my clients now, where I actually try to take as little as possible of the existing content and just say, let's figure out what our messaging really is. What are our three main customers? What are some other customers? What's our main messaging? Just work on that stuff. I want to give credit where it's due. My studio mate, Fred Gates, runs a little shop called Fred Gates Design. He had a client who said they ran a, a charity and they didn't have a lot of money and they said, we can only pay you to redesign our homepage this year and next year you can redesign maybe another couple pages of our site. But he took that money and being a very conscientious designer, he said, I'm going to put everything from the website onto this one page if I possibly can. And that's what he did. He took all the main points that I worked with him on this, he took all the main points of the content throughout the site and consolidated it down to a few key panels on a home page, which was all the customers really needed. And they're very happy because they spend very little money and they've got this beautiful page and the page does all these jobs for them now. And the first thing I did was steal this, right? So for a project that we're working on, this is not a final project, this is not approved. It probably won't end up looking like this, but this is the, this is the same concept. We took, I took Fred's idea and said, we're gonna do that for our client too. Our client had more money and they had more, we had more time to work on it, but I still said, well, you know what? Let's do the real work of figuring out what the customer needs to know, and let's move that to the front. And, and that's the, the client was on board. The client had the same approach. Yeah, let's get rid of all these pages if we can. A few pages that tell our story and get people to do things, if it's in their interest to do so, is much better than having all these pages just because we can or just because we built them in the past. Okay? So I came to talk to you about design, uh, content performance quotient. It's the speed of usefulness, how quickly you can solve a customer's problem. In order to do it, you need purpose-driven design and content. If your design isn't, isn't created for a reason, if you haven't made every decision for a reason to advance the organization's goals or to satisfy the customer's needs, then you can't really do this kind of design yet. And you have to figure that part out first. Now, very quickly in the last couple of minutes, um, there's another kind of site, a deep content site, and we need fast design for one kind of site, slow design for the other. I've written an article about it, it's on Medium, it's called, We Need Design That Is Faster and Design That Is Slower. Uh, the URL is in the show notes, and it's also uh, easy to find by Googling. All these URLs that I've mentioned are in the show notes, on the show notes page. And you might say, well, well, what kind of design do we need for who? We need designs faster for people that are trying to get things done and design that is slower for people who are trying to comprehend. Really quickly, if you have a deep content site that requires reading, then scannability, the very thing we need for the faster site, is your enemy. We make it so easy to, to scan that people read the headline and think they understand the article without reading the article. So a design for like a deep news site has to slow down the reader, and that's done with bigger type, better, type or hi better typographic hierarchy, more white space, and art direction on the most important content on the site. If an article's really super important, it needs to be art directed. And there are people who do this and are doing it right now as examples, and I can talk about this more next year. So come on back. Uh, but the Washington Post does certain key articles with art direction. All their main articles have lots of white space. They use typography judiciously. The New York Times uses different typography for opinion versus news to try to make it clear what's opinion and what's news. Not uh, ProPublica does it, Slate does it, Smashing Magazine does this, Vox. These are the ancestors, the sites that did it first. Readability, which was an app that made sites easier to read. Medium, which was one of the first big type sites. And A List Apart, which was one of the first big type sites. Again, which sites should be fast, which sites should be slow. If your content is delivered for the good of the public, you want to slow people down. That's a topic for another day. 
but if it's designed to promote your business and help the customer do what they came to do and get out of the customer's way, then it must be designed for speed of relevancy. And that's the challenge for most of us in this room, to get rid of all the stuff we don't need, focus on the essential, and make a beautiful, functional, fast-loading, accessible, inclusive design that communicates everything we need to communicate and nothing the customer and we don't need. That's what I came to talk about. You can follow me at Zeldman and at Design CPQ. Thank you very much.